What's up? Yeah. We ready. <laughs> Man, this is Chris. Yeah. This is Oscar. And welcome to Lost in Comics. Comics. Woo. That's right, baby. Man. This, hey. this isn't uh, a real quick right here. Super excited! I'm, I'm, I'm just, I'm losing myself already, man. I'm, already, I'm already lost. But uh, before we get too lost, guys, make sure you like and subscribe to the channel. Uh, find us on Instagram and Twitter, and uh, you know, in case you don't want to hear from us, uh, we got, we got a little visitor here for you. And he'll tell, you, he'll tell you himself. Here we go. Hey, it's me, Forrest, Forrest Gump. People call me Forrest Gump. I may not know what love is. But I do know what a good YouTube channel is. It's these guys here at Lost in Comics. Like this video and subscribe to their channel right now. Boom. Very good. Thank you, <laughs> Forrest. Thank you. He's a good guy, man. Yeah, he is a good guy. We played that last week for you guys, but, man, he's one of our favorite characters. So <laughs> thank you, Tom Hanks, for, for doing that character and then sending it over to us. It, that means a lot to us. So uh, before we get too far, let me just address some people in the chat. We had somebody here 27 minutes early today. That right. is amazing. Uh, <laughs> that is Wes Greer, Comics The Gathering. He says, I'm so excited that I'm here 27 minutes early. Hope everybody's having a great Thursday. He just got his uh, Philadelphia t-shirt and trade. So he's ready to roll for the show today. Uh, we got Joker fan pop culture talk, which is our friend William Pace. What's up, Will? Grabs Granites, we got Nat with Gin and Something, we got One Two Comic Talk, insert name here, 416. Of course, Posers in the House, we got uh, Joe, 47771, and Cole, Bearded Comic Bro, and people are going to keep rolling in. What's up, everybody? So glad you could join us today. Yeah. If you don't know, by now, we have an exciting well, show today. Super exciting. I, uh, if you guys have watched us before, we, when we have these interviews, we get a little bit excited, we geek out, we lose our mind a little bit. So I'm going to try, I'm trying to contain myself. Oscar and I have our coffee going. We got, uh, we've been talking about this for a couple of weeks. Uh, we are super excited. I know you guys are excited in the chats. Um, and we yes. want you guys to have a good time today. And you know, today we are talking to the great Rodney Barnes, writer of Philadelphia. Mm -hmm. <laughs> oh, man. I am excited, Oscar. I'm so excited. I, I, I don't. I don't see how any show could ever uh, outdo this, man. It's like a little dream come true, you know. If you would have told me when we started this channel six, seven months ago that we would have some of the best creators and writers, I wouldn't have believed you, man. But uh, you know, I don't believe you right now. <laughs> right? Let me, let me yeah. slap myself, man. Make sure I'm awake. <laughs> are you sure? Are you sure he's in the green room? But I don't. I don't know if this is really happening. Right? Yeah, no, he's there. But, he's ready. Uh... <laughs> Uh, we got Todd from Comic Burrito in the house, Samuel David, Comic Burritos here, and Longbox Diving. What is up, guys? Thank you guys for joining us today. Um, like, like we just mentioned a moment ago, we have Rodney Barnes coming on here in a few minutes. I do want to tell everybody before we get into the interview, I know I have a, a feeling there's going to be quite a few people asking a lot of questions. We're going to try to get to as many of those questions as we can and uh, give those over to Rodney to answer for you. Uh, we're gonna sprinkle those in along with the interview here. So please just be super patient with us as we try to get your questions, as we try to get our questions through. And of course, just to listen to Rodney, I'm sure we're all gonna just uh, just soak it all in and we're gonna have a great time today. And uh, after we talk to Rodney, man, as if that's not enough, we're gonna have new comic book day talk after the interview. So this is gonna be a fun show. We had some good books that came out yesterday. I cannot yes. wait to talk about that. Excellent but book. Before, before we get into that, how how are you doing? How's your week been, Oscar? Man, my week has been exciting. I, I've been looking forward to this. Uh, it, it's funny, like I'm I'm asleep at night, but like my mind is still kind of running, and I find myself waking up thinking about this interview, uh, and then with new comic books yesterday. There was so much good stuff to read yesterday. Uh, I I literally feel like I'm I have overload of of the comic world, man. But it's it's a beautiful thing, and yes. uh, like I always say, man, if we can get that love into somebody else and and they find that love for comics as well, then man, we did our job. So I'm ready, man. I'm ready. How about you? I'm doing great. Same same here, man. I've been filling my tank with comic uh, reading all week, research, um, and new comics yesterday. Uh, work has been good, but I am. 
as you know, Thursdays, Lost in Comic Thursdays, I can I cannot wait every single week. I can't wait to talk to everybody in the chat. I can't wait to have a couple of people on afterwards. Ah, oh, I can't wait. And I'm I'm thrilled. I'm ready. Are you ready? I'm ready, man. I'm ready. Pixar Nerd Studios, what is up? Thank you for being here. Let's uh let's get this thing rolling, bro. Let's go. Let's introduce him. Listen one and listen all. Sit up straight, wash your face, tuck in your shirt, and don't be late. Get your friends, sister, mother, father, and brother, because what we got for you today is a writer like no other. He's working movies to TV shows, that's right, the big screen to the little screen, and a whole bunch of things in between. He put his pen to paper and blew up the comic land. Lando Calrissian, that is, issues one through five. He also wrote Marvel's Falcon one through eight. The man who puts the kill in Philadelphia, introducing to you, Mr. Rodney Barnes. Yeah, Mr. Barnes, welcome. Welcome. You know, there's no way this could live up to the hype that you guys have created for this, right? There's no way. It's not, I can't live up to it. But yeah, you can do it. <laughs> the thing is, you can't. All you got to do is talk, man. And it is. Yeah. I hope yeah, you enjoyed the intro. Oh, I loved it. I want you guys to be my hype guys. I'm going to bring you everywhere. You'll be hey, I, we can be. <laughs> Sign us up. Sign us up. We're, we're ready to rock. Cool. Um, how, how are you doing today, Rodney? How, how have you been, I'm, sir? I'm doing okay. It's a lot going on, so I'm a little overwhelmed, but uh, I'm, I'm doing okay. Doing okay. Well, appreciate you making time and your busy schedule to come hang out with a couple of Couple of crazy guys that just love comic books. And I, I appreciate you guys supporting the book and um, all the enthusiasm. So it's my pleasure. Awesome, awesome. Well, before we get started, uh, Rodney, we like to do a little thing around here called the Rapido Ocho. I don't know if you've if you've seen one of our interviews before where we do this, um, but it is. Uh, I don't know if you're familiar with the character Rapido. He's a character that comes on our show. He is the fourth cousin of Barry Allen. Um, and he has some questions for you that he's developed over over some time from the most brilliant scientists from Astrea Labs. Astrea is a uh, Spanish for star, star labs, right? And mm -hmm. these questions are developed uh, to test the essence and true character of an individual. So I hope that you are ready for these for these I'm questions. Um, I can see me failing already, but go ahead. <laughs> and, and all you have to do is answer as quickly as possible. Okay, there he is. Welcome, Rapido. Yes, sir. I, I'm, I'm so glad to be here. You look familiar, but go ahead. <laughs> well, Mr. Barnes, like you said, we've got these questions for you, and uh, it's just a little icebreaker. We do just have some fun. So start off real quick. Number one, Batman or Iron Man? Batman. All right. Uh, question two, if you've seen the Godfather trilogy, which one is your favorite? Second. Awesome. Now, question three. In 1992, there was an Elseworld Batman story written. It was called Batman Dracula, uh, Red Rain, in 1992, where he actually becomes a vampire. Mm -hmm. So this Batman is after you. Who do you get to protect you? Blade or Tevin? Blade. Okay. Seesaw. Blade. All right. Blade. Yeah. I worked on the movie Blade, the first one. Yes, yeah, yeah. That, we're going we're gonna to get into that. Job. Yeah, it's my first job in Hollywood. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, if you were a Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtle, which one would you be and why? Uh, Donatello. Um, I just like the name. <laughs> All right. And uh, Michael Jordan or LeBron James? Oh, Jordan. Jordan. My man. Uh, number six, you wake up in the zombie apocalypse. What's your weapon of choice? Oh, man. Uh, I'm going to say a gun. Uh, I don't have that Michonne thing. You know, I get tired after too much. Of that. I just, yeah, I need a gun, something. All right. <laughs> a big clip. Number seven, uh, you're given the power to bring one hero into our reality to change the world. Who would it be? Adam Warlock. All right, good one. Very good. And last question, who really wins in a race, Superman or The Flash? Flash. Awesome. It was so much fun. I got to go, though, all right? <laughs> Thank you, Rapido. Yes. I would say that you passed eight out of eight, Rodney. I think that Thank was, you. That Thank was you. beautiful. So far, so good. So far, so, so good. Far, so good. Um, yes. Uh, before we get into 
talking business. Um, so we like to get to know you a little bit more. Um, so, you know, outside of writing beautiful scripts and beautiful words, what, what are some of Rodney Barnes' daily responsibilities? What are, what, what's your duties aside of, outside of writing? I, do I do anything else? Um, well, <laughs> I mean, my primary, my day job is uh, television for the most part. So my day usually starts with, hey, he looks familiar. <laughs> okay. uh, mostly working in TV. I mean, the bulk of my day starts um, on a Zoom now because we're in this pandemic. And mm -hmm. um, usually for about 10 hours or so a day, Zooming um, about TV. That's the bulk of my life. That's awesome, and that's why, and that's why you've been successful because you devote so much time into that, and you live it, you breathe it, and it and it and it comes out into everything you do. Um, nice. That's awesome. So, how early or late did you um, did you start reading comics? And was there a particular story or a character that really drew you into comics when you were growing up? I started reading comics. My mother was a school teacher, and she used to take me to the public library because way back then uh, to do her lesson plans. And I used to have a box of old comics that was like stashed under um, the real books. And uh, I somehow I found these books, and um, it was an old Avengers, a Kirby Avengers, uh, and Neil Adams. Um, speedy issue of green lantern um yeah. this is before you guys' time but um <laughs> i remember just being i'd say five six seven years old that wow. was when this thing started uh it's like a uh, it's like a disease once it gets in your system it's hard to let go yeah yeah i totally agree with that <laughs> absolutely and so, so growing up, you know, you, you start reading comic books. You're you're drawn to these characters. Uh, when was the moment when you kind of said, "Hey, I want to be a writer"? Well, when did writing kind of take its uh, take its place in your life? Uh, I was a class clown because I was a troubled kid, and um, my journalism teacher, Mr. Silverberg, he gave me an assignment for the school newspaper, and uh, I think he. I took it personal, like he wanted to make fun of me. So I really put some effort into the article. And when I came back, he said, you know, if you put as much effort into uh, writing as you did to being a class clown, you could be a really good writer. And it stuck someplace in my head, that writer, you know, and I always sort of had a relationship with words. I loved reading and the arts and just um, stuff that, a kid typically wouldn't um, kind of veer towards. It's like I didn't, it wasn't so much like writing for in school, but I would pick, back then they used to have these spinners like they did with comics with paperback books. And I would go and spend my allowance on books just to read. Like I remember reading Carrie for the first time and was a big fan of Richard Matheson and Alan Dean Foster and um, just a lot of sci-fi genre writers. And this is like eight, nine years old. I used to love this stuff. So it sort of walked with me. And then when I got out of high school and went into college and realized that I was never going to be the athlete that in my head I thought I was, it was like, okay, we got to figure out something to do with our lives. So I started to take writing seriously um, for first for television and film and um, just really immerse myself in the craft and try to get better and better and better. And um, here we are. Well, man, I really think that uh, if, if you hadn't taken his, uh, his advice to start writing, you'd probably be a great comedian. Uh, well, it, you know, the, the comedy that I do, they don't do anymore. It was um, sort of, um, you know, even the, the Richard Pryor, uh, Steve mm -hmm. Martin, you know, those types of guys. It's like comedy has evolved so much that it's a real today. You have to be able to do more uh, personal type comedy. It's like the political comedy is dead. Uh, mm -hmm. Certainly anything that veers with controversial subjects uh, you stay away from. So I grew up in that world where that was sort of um, at its, I won't say its height, but it certainly was what most comics were doing. So I don't know if I would make it 
today if that were <laughs> were you a uh, kind of off topic here but were, were you a fan of the office i was uh yeah i was a fan of the office i actually adapted um one of the the guys that created it they had something else they were bringing to america that i did an adaptation on but um i dug it i liked it that's one. it's that's definitely one of our favorite shows but i always i tell people that you know if that show was to try to be try to be created right now in this in this time that we're living in i don't think it would uh, i don't think it could even get off the ground you know uh, <laughs> twitter might kill it before uh, <laughs> way before yeah. uh, but uh, but yeah, such such a good show. Um, so I heard you do an interview. Uh, I was I was watching some doing some research, and I heard you do an interview where you described uh, you were on you were on the set of Green Mile. So let, let's start there. What, what were you doing on the set of Green Mile? What was your what was your task uh, there? Well, I was Michael Clark Duncan stand-in for the John Coffey character for the movie The Green Mile, and um, I lobbied to be a part of it because I really wanted to meet Stephen King and I was a big fan of Frank Darabont's mm -hmm. and I read the book and I was a real big fan of the book and I was a production assistant on a movie Stigmata uh, with mm -hmm. Gabriel Byrne. Mm -hmm. and, uh, the transportation coordinator for Stigmata was going to go over on the Green Mile. So I begged him to let me, he was going to take the 1939 paddy wagon that's in the movie to, um, the Warner Brothers backlot, I believe. And Frank Darabont was gonna be there to take a look at it. So I basically convinced him to let me get in the back of it. And um, they took, I was in the back, in a 1939 paddy wagon, uh, has no air conditioning or a shock absorber. So I looked like an inmate by the time I got there. <laughs> and uh, after jumping out and scaring that shit out of everybody, uh, <laughs> Frank Darabont appreciated how much I wanted to be a part of the production that he made me um, basically that char that character stand in, even though we look nothing alike. <laughs> but, uh, I was there. I got an opportunity to meet Stephen King and um, uh, he signed all my books and he was incredibly gracious. Wow. And a big mm -hmm. picture of us over my fireplace. And um uh, Tom Hanks was incredible. Um, I'd worked on, I was a day player production assistant on a movie, Forrest Gump. So I could relate to your intro. You can't <laughs> met him before. Um, but it was a great experience all the way around. And it sort of um, fueled my desire even more so to get back into genre. Because up until that point, I'd had opportunities here and there to do comedy, uh, to write comedy. And um, but my heart was really in the stuff I'm doing now. So specifically, I remember I I heard a I heard you say something about the Green Mile in one of these interviews you did about that you were watching. I don't know if it was an actor or if it was uh, somebody a, a director, um, but that they inspired you um, by watching them do their craft. Um, could could you share that with us? Yeah, I mean, it, it was such a um, commitment like i had worked on movies before a lot of movies and, and some really big name movies as a production assistant and um i'd never really worked on anything that spoke directly to what i wanted to do um and this was like a fantasy type scenario uh, shout out to my friend constantine nazir who was a uh who did the uh, behind the scenes uh DVD stuff. If you guys want to get the uh, DVD, he did the uh, behind the scenes stuff. But Bernie Wrightson was there every day because he did the concept work and he gave me a Frankenstein portfolio. Uh, mm -hmm. that he signed. Like I said, Stephen King, Frank Darabont, Tom Hanks, uh, you know, Michael Jeter. It's like the cast was like an A-list cast. And it's something about when you're working in a space where everybody loves what they're doing, mm -hmm. uh, where everybody's sort of a um, emotionally attached to the material, like it's more than a job. There's something that sort of uh, emanates from the entire production that sucks you in. And it's sort of, um, I was living in my car at the time because I lived in my car for like the first eight months when I got to Hollywood. And it was moments like that. And Blade had a similar uh, thing too. I was too green to be able to uh, let it seep in as deeply as it did on the green mile. But 
there's something about being around folks who love what they do. Um, and it's almost like kids playing. It doesn't feel like work because <laughs> there's yeah. something beautiful about it. And it made all of the hardship because they were really long days. And, um, you know, like I said, um, getting off means going back to my car. Doesn't mean I'm going home. That, that's home for the moment. But uh, it didn't feel like hard. It didn't feel bad because I could. I look forward to the next day just being able to do it again. Awesome. And it's. Uh, I want to uh, throw something out there real quick. When I when I was 18, uh, I left home. Uh, I wasn't in California, unfortunately, trying to make it. But uh, I lived in my car as well for like two weeks until I found a a high school friend of mine and I. We got an apartment together. Anyways. Uh, I just feel like I'm in good company then, you know, hopefully I can be successful one day as well. <laughs> you know, so. Yeah, if you're willing, uh, I used to say uh, I suffer well. I have the ability to take yeah. long periods of painful scenarios and um, make my way through them. So there you go. Yeah. Yeah. Well, you know, I know we're here. We're going we're gonna to get to comics here in a little bit. We're going to gush over Philadelphia and, all, and your comic book writing. Um, but you've you kind of you entered this world writing uh, with TVs and movies. Uh, so, what was your when was your first break in writing, and and how, how did that happen? My first uh, WGA official job. I had done a lot of little stuff in between. Um, was for the TV show My Wife and Kids. Uh, that was my first uh, Love that show. real gig. Um, and I got that via my relationship with Damon Wayans from Major Payne. Um, and he gave me an opportunity as a punch-up writer to come in. Uh, I think it was for one day, and I just wouldn't stop coming back. And this was before 9-11. It was right before 9-11 when the rules and security-wise was a little looser. So I made a relationship with the security guard after my first day. And he's like, oh, you're back again. I said, yeah, man, it's good to see you. And I had no pass. I would just show up in the office and sit on the couch and eventually after not going home uh, for a while, they just gave me a job and let me stay. So, wow. Wow. <laughs> Man. Persistent pays off then, I guess, you know. <laughs> it was like adopting a dog. Uh, I was terrified though. I mean, I was, <laughs> and still semi-terrified when it comes to this profession. But, um, you know, those early years, I'd say the first maybe 10 years of my career were met every day with, uh, I met with fear. It was, um, you know, you go through, do I belong here? Um, I didn't want it to go away. Uh, I loved it so much that it was hard to um, get comfortable with it. So, yeah. It's funny when I hear you talking talking about that because I've I've heard you say that a couple of times in some interviews that I've uh, that I've heard, and uh, and we're going to talk about uh, Falcon here in a little bit, but um, it, I, I can't tell. You know some of the some of your works that I've that I've watched that I that I see that you that I've read that you've written. Um, I don't none of that none of that comes out in your writing. I know that 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 has to be something internal for you, but I just want you to know as as a fan, uh, I I can't I couldn't detect it, uh, especially in, in in Falcon. I appreciate <laughs> it. I mean, those first yeah. three issues of Falcon, I was I met with abject terror. Um, I did not understand. The relationship between um, words and art, and so th some of the jokes I was writing from a place of what I'd write for TV, and I was writing in my voice instead of Sam Wilson's voice. Um, yeah, yeah. You know, by the time I picked up a rhythm, it was around book four, and it was funny because it was this one guy on Twitter, and he was killing me. He was killing me in my inbox. How much he hated the book. How much he hated me. How much he hated my family. Um, wow. And this is like every, I remember going to a movie, uh, I think it was called The Post. Um, it was Meryl Streep. She worked at, she owned the Washington Post. I think Tom Hanks was in it, uh, maybe. And I couldn't watch the movie because my phone kept dinging. And it was mostly this guy who hated the book and was continuously telling me how much he hated the book. And once I was able to get past his criticism, within his criticism, there was some truth. And once I was able to get past my feelings and see that I had to take a step back, um, I sort of relaxed a little bit. I think issue four was my best and favorite issue of that run. And I just got better. I just kind of settled in 
and relaxed a little bit. And I think the biggest thing was I'd had a period away from comics where I wasn't part of, there was a period where comics were like my life. And um, I think it was late, late eighties and early nineties. Um, and then in between something happened. And I think comics evolved and I did and trying to find my voice and trying to find a rhythm uh, was, it wasn't the easiest thing in the world to do. But fortunately, I had an opportunity to keep doing it over and over and over again, which was something that I think made me better. So from the last three or four books of Falcon to Quincredible for Lion Forge to um, Philadelphia, you know, I developed my own approach, even the way that I went about approaching how to do a book uh, changed. It became... Um, which is a big part of the process for me, how I approach it. It wasn't so much haphazard and, oh, my God, I got to get it in. It's Marvel. Gee, what am I going to do? Uh, to, you know, making it a schedule and making it um, just a more relaxed process for me. Uh, so that that particular person that was messaging you on Twitter, um, that person may have been messaging you, but I sent you a tweet um, back in uh, 2018, and this was bef long before oh, Lost in Comics. you saved the tweet. Yeah. <laughs> I'm reading I the saved tweet. the tweet. Once you thank tweet something you. out, it's there. Right? It's there thank forever, so. Man, thank you very much. I appreciate it. You know, the funny thing is um, you probably were one of the few people. It's like the one girl that goes out with you, even though, <laughs> you know, the, all of you've been rejected so much. Just one person says, you know what, you're not such a bad guy. Come on, I'll go with you. It was like that. I think I've been, I was so traumatized that I probably couldn't take uh, your compliment <laughs> that it was given. Uh, that was a yeah, tough. Yeah, and that's, that's, yeah, it's funny. I remember I read Falcon and I had, I had actually never, I had not been a fan of Falcon very much. And Me. Marvel was kind of doing that reset after uh, Secret Empire. Mm -hmm. And I remember reading Falcon and I was at the time, if you go look on my Twitter account, I would tweet about the San Antonio Spurs all the time. I'm a big Spurs fan. So if you go onto my Twitter account, you have all these tweets about, you know, the, the NBA and sports. But somewhere in there is the tweet I sent to you because it impacted me that much at the time to where I read that book. And I was like, man, this this is not your typical um, Marvel, you know, just kind of. I don't want to. I don't want to say this the wrong way, but just it was not a shallow story. It was deep. I felt like it was yeah. a deep story being told, which I appreciated very much. And I, I read it, and I was like, "This is this is totally not what I expected," and I loved it. Um, so I, yeah, I, I wanted to send you that that tweet, uh, which you responded and you said, "You know, thank you," which meant a lot to me. Is just somebody that just a, a fan of your work to to respond to something like that. And I know yeah. that I speak for the comic book community. Uh, we appreciate that so much. You're one of the most uh, active um, people on Twitter that will actually talk to your fans, retweet things, and that's mm -hmm. something that uh, that you don't get from all creators. And we we really appreciate that. Uh, and like I said, I know I'm speaking for the community uh, when I say that. So again, you know, thank you. Um, well, it means it means a ton to us. Thank you, but it also means a lot to me that someone's taken the time and their money to not only uh, purchase your book, read it, think about it. Uh, become emotionally invested in it. Um, I remember I'm an only child, so comic books was sort of like a best friend for a long time, and they still sort of occupy that space in my heart. I think um, anytime I've gone through hardship in life, whether it was uh, divorce or disappointment or you know money problems or sickness or whatever, comics were always there to sort of occupy my mind and uh, in a weird kind of way give me hope. But it was still an isolated thing. It was just me and these stories. And then you come to find that there's a whole community of folks who love this stuff as much, if not more, than you do. And it's such an honor to um, be part of the community um, and to just kind of commiserate with like-minded people and, for the most part, good people. Um, it just sort of brings something to life that sometimes is missing. I think sometimes uh, we live in a pretty mean world 
at times and we're going through a lot and it's sort of like an extended family of folks so if i can send a book if i can do something to contribute to um making someone see how much i really appreciate them um i don't mind well real quick before we move on from falcon i i hearing you talk about like finding your own your own voice uh, and it wasn't until like issue four that you really felt it it really makes me i enjoyed the book as well and uh chris wind up getting me uh the copies as well so i could reread those and i i enjoyed it just as much uh the second time around and one thing that really hit me about that story was when he was trying to find himself and not be in the shadow of of steve rogers or captain america and or under his dad or any anything else and hearing you say that you kind of were finding yourself as well really makes me like it even more than because it's it's real you know and i i've noticed that in your writing i feel like when you put the real things in there uh people pick up on it you know and i i really enjoy that i really enjoy that so uh, well i i can tell you exactly how that came about that hasn't always been an aspect of my work uh certainly in tv but yeah. I got really sick in the end of 2012, 2013, and uh, almost passed away. And I had a good friend come to the hospital. And uh, he was an, he's an executive uh, in TV, plus he's also a minister. And he prayed for me before I went into surgery. And he said that uh, he asked me why I do what I do. And I told him, you know, as a kid, I loved it so much. And TV, movies, just genre stuff was uh, just made, it was so much fun. It just made me feel good. And he said, so it was a heart thing, right? And I said, yeah. He said, so you're writing now. Are you writing from your heart? And I said, no. He said, where are you writing from? I said, my head and I'm <laughs> money. Yeah. He said, you know, I think you would enjoy this a lot more if you wrote from your heart more. And for some reason, I think between fear and the imposter syndrome and a bunch of other insecurity and anxiety and things that I had brought from back home to my profession um, sort of clouded whatever ability I might have. And so I started to clear my mind a little bit more. And um, the biggest compliment is what you said. Thank you. That when you feel the real stuff, because it's real coming from me, I mean, mm -hmm. there are probably a dozen moments in Philadelphia that were based upon things that really happened in my life or things that where I was moved or the overall sentiment of the book is attached to my belief system um, that, especially in book six, when uh, the last scenes between uh, Sankster Jr. and Sr. Um, yeah. It, it's sort of, it's written for those guys, but I think my goal is to spread that sentiment out to everyone that's willing to hear it. I think, um, you know, everybody's got flaws. Nobody's perfect. So there you go. That's uh, that, that really, uh, what you're, what you're talking about, about, you know, writing from, from the heart uh, rather than the head. I think that um, as you can tell, we love comics, right? We love comic book characters, but I do think that that's something that is, is sometimes missing in today's writing is that, you know, these guys, so much is put on them. These guys that are writing several books at a time, uh, not no fault of their own, but a lot of times they have to write from the head, right? They got to get a story out. They got to, mm -hmm. you know, they got a schedule to hit to make. And I do think that's something that's missing in writing sometimes. And, and you can you can sense that. And that sometimes it's a good story, but the, the stories that really hit home are the ones where writers like yourself take the time to really put their heart into the work and, yeah, definitely with with Philadelphia, uh, with Falcon. I mean, I, I felt it like I, I could feel off the page uh, the emotion of it. Um, so again, a, a testament to to your writing. Uh, and we, I wish that every, and I'm sure every writer has that intention going into a story. They want to write from the heart, um, but sometimes you know workload and and scheduling and all that stuff it starts to get in the way. And um, so again, kudos to you and and we 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 love it. Um, Thank you. I mean, I think some guys, you know, the, the real big, super talented guys of uh, today and yesterday, um, some of those guys are able to just pull it out and just do it. I'm not I haven't I'm not that good quite yet to be able to just do it on mass. But uh, if you give me time, I'll do my best to tell the best story I can. Yeah, well, if Philadelphia is any kind of indication of 
future things or where you're headed. I I, I just want to be along for the ride, man. I, I'm I'm in. I'm in with whatever you're gonna do. So <laughs> thank you very much. I appreciate that. So yeah, right before we, we're going to talk about Philadelphia after this question here, but I don't want to fail to mention the Star Wars Lando uh, Double or Nothing book that you wrote. Um, mm -hmm. And just tell us how, how deep does your love for Star Wars go? Pretty deep. Um, <clears throat> I uh, mostly the first three: um, A New Hope, Empire, and um, Return of the Jedi. Those were I saw those as a kid and. Um, fell in love with it. You know, the other ones, not quite as much um, as those first three, but uh, also the extended universe from Marvel. Um, I dig those books as well. So it was an honor just to be able to play in that universe. And um, there's a rumor. I'm not going to start that rumor that I may be going back to the Star Wars universe. So we'll see. Oh man, I'm, uh, I'm in. We're in. We're in, man. Uh, we'll just see. like, uh, Nick Kuhn in the chat right now says, I will buy anything with Rodney's name on it. Anything he's involved uh, in, I'm in. Thank you. So, thank yeah. you very much, Nick. I appreciate that. So let's get into let's get into Philadelphia. I know a lot of people in the chats, um, you have a, a, a great fan base around this book. And I feel like it's as each issue has come out, like Steam has been building up for this book. Um, so I guess before we get into it, I guess just tell us uh, Summarize for us a little bit. That you, can you pinpoint a time where this idea for Philadelphia was birthed with you? Well, yeah. I mean, I think um, I was roughly eight or nine years old when I started to uh, get deep into um, horror films, vampires in particular, the Hammer films with uh, Peter Cushing and uh, Christopher Lee, and then Bram Stoker's book and Salem's Lot and uh, and Rice's Vampire Chronicles and all of that kind of stuff just sort of seeped into my mind. And I kept trying to figure out ways if I were to write a book one day or do a graphic novel, how would I do it? And so the same way I approach um, anything, it's got to happen in, you know, the head and heart first. Of how can I how would this work? And over the years, I had the idea of Cole Shack the Night Stalker was a big, big influence when I was a kid. Um, you guys are too young for that TV show. <laughs> but but I loved that show as a kid. And uh, Richard Matheson wrote the uh, movie of the week that um, about a vampire, about uh, Carl Kolschak being on the hunt for a vampire. And I just kind of started there. I mean, I wasn't aware enough to think my ideas had any merit. So I would take other people's ideas and say, okay, I could do that, but do it differently. How would I do it differently? And it just kind of stayed there, it just kind of stayed in my head and I rolled it around and rolled it around. And then once I broke into the industry, I tried it as a movie, I tried it as TV shows and no one would bite. And then no pun intended. And then um, <laughs> uh, once I started doing comics, then it was like, hey, maybe I could do this as a comic. And then, um, Jason, Sean, Alexander, and I, we were friends before we started doing the book. And I pitched it to him one night over dinner. Uh, no real agenda in mind. It was just, hey, I got this idea I've been working on for years. And he said, man, that's pretty cool. You know, I think we should do something like that. Man. And I sort of dismissed it after that. And then he called me like a week later and he said, that idea you had, that Philadelphia thing, he's like, do you have anything down on paper? And I said, no, but, you know, I can. And I wrote out a um, an extended treatment that he sent to Image, and because uh, he was doing Spawn at that time, and uh, they liked the idea and they gave us a book. Man. that's such a that's like a I couldn't imagine any any other artist on that book as well. So I I just feel like when it's like Destiny, right? I mean, it's Jason is, Jason is like more than an artist. I see him as like a director. It's like the way he. Um, the facial expressions and um, mm -hmm. how characters move um, in the book, it's like it's its more than just art. It just feels like he's bringing it to life. Yeah. And um, very honored to have him be a partner in this journey. We have a uh, somebody in the chat. Uh, her name is Nat. Uh, she goes by Jen and something here. But she I heard her talking about Philadelphia the other day, and she was talking about Jason. 
uh, about how his lion, he, she loves the abuse of his lions. And I was like, that's so true. Like when you, when you look at, when you look at his work, I mean, you don't see any like straight lines with character, you know, perfect faces. He has this way of, you know, the blood splatter and, and almost like emotion that's kind of always going through the book, you yeah. know, setting the scene, the tone for that book. Uh, and it's, it really is amazing. Seen his work on issue seven, which hasn't dropped yet, it's probably the best work to date. Man. Wow, that's saying a lot. I mean, yeah. he, he turned in the last pages uh, the other night, and uh, it's just a beautiful, it's a beautiful book. It actually pushes me because, as a fan, I want to see him do certain things. Like there's a uh, there's a scene and. One of the issues, I think it's five, where Sangster is uh, in the coffin. He's got his hounds folded, yeah. and they're angels above and they're demons below. Yeah. And uh, that came. I went, I went to the Sixteen Chapel, the Sistine Chapel, and um, I saw one of those images like at the top, and I said, "Man, I wonder if we could get something like that into Philadelphia." So I just described it in the script, and um, he took a shot at it. It's beautiful, man. Who, I mean, it's just so crazy to hear like inspiration for certain things, right? That, that and that page alone uh, sticks out to me as well. It's it's very spooky, you know that that picture. You know, it really makes you think. Like, it's just crazy, man. That's <laughs> yeah, that is it. That's definitely like that's a standout panel for me. As I was doing the reread the other day, I was like, dude, and I, I'm glad you an like answered that question because I was wondering what's the inspiration with this because it is that's a, a beautiful panel and one that stands out in all the issues. Um, but did, did you ever imagine that Philadelphia was going to be so well received by, by the community? No, ever since Falcon, you know, it's like I had that traumatic uh, feeling, that fearful feeling that people will hate this. And, um, you know, because Falcon isn't my creation, it's like, okay, you can hate the story, but the character will endure and there'll be other better writers and people who will come on and, uh, you know, bring him, give him what he deserves. But when it's something that came out of you, you know, there's that sense of, and, and you put your heart, you just open a vein and bleed on the page and, and do everything that you can to, um, you know, do the best work that you can. Then, you know, there's this different trepidation that you approach it with. And just so fortunate that um, people dug it, you know, for the most part. And um, again, I think a lot of that is attributable to Jason's work. I think Jason, um, he really can tell a great story. Yeah. yeah, absolutely. Do you want to put that question back up there, Oscar? Yeah. Like God thinks. Uh, so he just said, uh, you know, thanks guys for this interview. It's great. Thanks, Mr. Barnes, for your talent. My favorite okay. movie is The Lost Boys. So I love vampires. Did did you like that movie? I love that movie. I watch that movie at least every three months or so. Um, <laughs> The one thing I really love is the sexy guy on the beach um, playing the saxophone <laughs> as the uh, vampires are like riding around on the motorcycles. There's something about uh, just there's a there's a campiness, but it's a cool kind of campiness. It, yeah. It's weird because you know they're making jokes and they're doing certain things, but you know the the tone is perfect for that era, and um, I dug it. Keep for yeah. Sutherland was cool. Everybody, everything was great about that movie. I love that movie. That's that's funny you mentioned that because that's how I was gonna end my part of the show. I was gonna get my saxophone out and, and kind of do a dance. Well, hey, you gotta take your shirt off. You gotta take your <laughs> shirt off. You gotta take your shirt off, and you gotta flex as you play the saxophone. It's <laughs> something about that that made me want to get in shape and play the saxophone. It didn't work. I didn't get in shape, nor can I play the saxophone. But <laughs> that scene stays in my head, and the yeah. song that goes with it. But yeah, yeah, that's good yeah. stuff, though. <laughs> Do it, Rodney. You'll end up doing it, Rodney. Trust me. No, it's, I mean, it's, uh, no, it's not gonna happen. It's not gonna happen. <laughs> Maybe, Lord willing, uh, the in shape part. If we, um, if this COVID, if the pandemic lasts long enough, maybe, but yeah. not playing the saxophone. <laughs> no. uh, I do. I do want to uh, going back to Philadelphia. I do want to say that um, I think Oscar and I were a little ahead of the curve on this. Uh, on, on getting on board of Philadelphia, um, do you, Oscar? Do you have the clip? The clip that or not? The yeah, it's it's about a it's about a minute. But this is uh, I'm gonna set it up for you. This happened uh, 
well, like almost six months ago, we we reviewed uh, Philadelphia one and two, and this is our grading, how we graded it, and not everything like that. But anyways, you can check this out. You can uh, tell we're both we both yeah. love this book. Uh, let's give it the uh, let's give it the old let's gauntlet. Give the, let's give it the gauntlet. Gauntlet. That's how you say it. Gauntlet. Uh, gauntlet. I'll go first. Yeah, you go first. Philadelphia one and two. Five. Money. I'm gonna give it a five. Man, this is like I said, it's perfect, man. I I'm reading this book and I'm I would have paid more money to to buy these books. Yeah. Like I mean, it was a four ninety nine issue, mm-hmm. three ninety nine issue. I would. Probably pay nine ninety nine an issue. Like, just take my money, man. This is this is a great book. Yeah. So, Philadelphia one and two, awesome read. I'm gonna give it a five. I I throw in the save. I had one more, you know, but I don't. But all six stones, I guess, you know. There's another just stone. To, just to yeah. throw it, just to throw, give it a give it that on the top cherry on top. Definitely. But uh, definitely a five. If you can even find the copies, yeah, uh, good luck. Yeah, good luck. Yeah. But get them. It's it. You won't you won't go wrong with this uh, this story. It's really it's really good. To, uh, you can tell we're both. We're- All right, about that song. You guys are way more more enthusiastic today. It's like I appreciate it, but today, yeah. it's, you know, I guess I earned it over time. But, uh, <laughs> but thank you. But thank you. Absolutely. Yeah, yeah and and I I told Oscar let's pull up that old clip when we read Philadelphia for the first time because. Uh, you know, Oscar and I, we, we had kind of just started the show around that time. So he and I were kind of getting comfortable doing this. Um, and but, but at the root of it, man, we love Philadelphia. The moment we read it, we picked up issue one. We both got it on yeah. New Comic Book Day, and we've been on board ever since. Um, it's been, like I said, it's been it's really been one hell of a ride. It's been really good. Um, Thank you very much. So, uh, in, in Falcon... And even, of course, much more so in Philadelphia, you really get into some meat of father-son relationship. Uh, I mean, that's, that's some really, some heavy stuff. And quite honestly, when I finished uh, issue six, man, my eyes watery, you know? I, I really, uh, we, Oscar and I, uh, we really relate to father-son stories. Um, God Country is another one that we love because of that, that same concept of father-son. So uh, how much, my question is, how much of that did you draw from your own experience as a, as a son? Are, are you a father? You're not a father. I'm a father. I'm a father and I'm a son. Um, okay. I, um, all of it, I'd have to say. I mean, I think um, I was a young father and I wasn't, my youth and my lack of direction got in the way of me being the best father I can be. So I think, um you know, the regret that I felt for that period of my life. I wanted to talk about that. And then I tried to be empathetic to how my son must have felt, you know, having um, a less than perfect father. And so I wanted him in the back of the trade. I actually dedicate the book to my father and to my son. Um, Just trying to work through the issues I had with my father, uh, issues my son may have had with me. the general state of how difficult it is to be a parent, um, all of it. It's like uh, each issue, and I still do that. Each issue, I sort of take on um, a theme, um, and of how I want to play the the interpersonal dynamics, and that usually plays out throughout the issue, and it attaches itself to the full arc of what I'm trying to say what I'm hoping to say. Hmm. Yeah, I like like Chris said, we 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 enjoy those kind of stories with uh where there's a good father son bad relationship or a good relationship but where it's always tied together. Um I myself was uh I come from a you know just a mother who who raised me and my brother uh mm-hmm. for for a good part of our life. So you know I came from I come from a place where I had to be like you know the man of the house uh, at a very young age, you know. Um but now that I have kids, I always try to think of like being that kind of father that's good to them and, and there for them, even though I make tons of mistakes. Um, but in, in the writing of, of Philadelphia, like I see, I, I see a lot of myself and how I play with my sons, you know, and, mm-hmm. and even though I'm playful with them, I can be very hard on them and, and I can make them feel like their effort isn't always the best. And I, cause I want to push them to do more and, and be more. And uh, I kind of saw that with the father son relationship when, when uh, you know in the story when he kind of 
he kind of, you know, gets on him a little bit about him taking so long when he finally got him out of the coffin, you know, and yeah. it's like, it's about time, you know, <laughs> it's yeah. just funny. It just reminded me of like how I would be with my kids, you know, with my sons. So, <laughs> yeah, I mean, I think I wanted it to feel real. I wanted it to be um, both ends of the spectrum. It's like, um, there's some moments where you feel the animosity from the son. There's some moments where you feel the frustration from the dad. Then there are moments where you realize that, you know, these two guys love each other. And yeah. just, you know, issue six was hopefully trying to tie that all up and bring a foundation to um, the journey of issues one through six and saying, you know, whatever this relationship is slash was, um, there was real love under it. Yeah. Absolutely. Uh, Oscar, can you put that panel, that picture of that panel? There's a, so one of my, this is, and I posted this on Twitter the other day, Instagram. This is one of my, one of my favorite panels of the whole book, right? And it, it, you, you come to the realization of, you know, you go through all these situations in life um, and what, you know, what is really important, you know, you have these highs and these lows through life. Um, and, it, but at the end of it, you know, you, you have to you have to have offer forgiveness to people, right? And um, just recently, um, I had a uh, one of my uncles. You can take that off, Oscar. Um, one of my uncles uh, opened up to to my to my mother, and he he's already he's seventy nine years old, and he was telling my mother about some of the regrets that he had with my grandfather which is, of course, his father. Um, and, and my grandfather passed away, you know, 15 years ago. And he never, never clear, you know, never cleared up, cleared his conscience and really told his his father how he felt. Um, and when I'm when I was reading this, that panel right there, you know, it really I had, had that story in my head that my mom had just told me. Uh, and she was telling me, you know, you need to make everything right with your dad. You need to make sure, you know, everything, you know, that you're you clear everything up right now. Um, but just again, going back to Philadelphia, all the that that's that to me, when you're reading a book and you can take what you're reading, apply it to your life and feel that connection with the book and yet kind of be, gain perspective on your own life. That that is a good comic book. When I'm reading this. I'm, I'm thinking about that. Uh, and I also had another uh, friend of the family pass away uh, the other day. And then all of that stuff was just in my head while I'm reading this. And again, uh, I know this is like a big uh, you know, love Rodney gushing over Rodney Barnes today. But man, I, I have to tell you, man, that that's that just the impact of that. And I know there's several people in the chat that are saying the same thing. And again, I, I want you to know you're on the right track. You're just it's it's beautiful man it's really a beautiful thing i really appreciate that i mean i think um for me books like um like this one um alan moore's swamp thing i don't know if you can see it or if the glare is right there it was sort of that for me a, a similar thing they were like maybe five or six runs of books throughout my reading history that really touched my heart and I felt like my earlier work lacked that. I wasn't being vulnerable enough. I wasn't able to look at myself. I think sometimes it's hard to forgive other people, but I think it's even hard for some people to forgive themselves for the mm. mistakes that you make in life. And I think part of that process is being willing to, like when I was going through my earlier stuff, um, I wasn't really close to my biological father growing up and I didn't get along with my stepfather. And when you're a kid, I think you take that stuff personally. I think you think it's about you. But then when you become a parent and you realize how difficult life is, and then you realize that those guys had an experience that happened before they met me that sort of framed, you know, whatever um, fears and anxieties and, you know, being a parent, raising a kid. And it wasn't like I was the perfect kid by far. Um, you start to put them into perspective, you start to put yourself into perspective, and you realize that oftentimes it's not personal, it's just people do the best that they can do. And if you're able to make that distance between your hurt and um, not personalizing your hurt, uh, feeling it for sure, but not necessarily um, looking, I didn't wanna be a victim, 
and I didn't want to make, once you make a story, you frame a story where there's a good guy and there's a bad guy, oftentimes that story becomes like a prison, becomes like a cage. It's hard to leave the reality of that story. And if you tell that story enough to yourself, I think you start to believe it. And once belief sets in, then it's kind of written in stone and it sort of takes over uh, in your life. I didn't want that to happen to me. And I didn't want to get to a place where there are regrets, uh, but most of them aren't based upon, um, they're based upon things that I've done, not so much what uh, other people have done to me because that's my perception. And um, who knows from um, how much of it was true from my childhood, we're trying to remember it as an adult. It's like, it may have been a different story. So all of that to say, I think forgiveness is huge. And I think um, any of my work going forward, I always want to have a moment where I'm speaking to something that um, is real. And that's my way of connecting to people and hopefully them connecting to me. Yeah. Are any, are any, are any possible to sell me more, you know, get me more involved? <laughs> uh, man. I'm telling you, I'm hiring you guys as my publicist. Uh, from this point <laughs> Well, I want, we're going to DM, and I want you guys to follow me around and just tell people, man, he's not that bad, really, really. You got it, man. You got it. Hey, and if you want, I'll go look for that guy to give you a hard time as well, man. I'll find him. He's around. I know he's way – I think he came back about maybe a year ago. He um, he kind of resurfaced. And, um, oh, man. And he resurfaced when he would screen capture panels and dialogue that he hated. And he just put it out there and he's like, look at this. This is horrible. Da, da, da. And uh, <laughs> some in the comment section, people started to say, well, I really like his Incredible. Or I really like his Lando. And, you know, I like Philadelphia and I like the stuff. And he wasn't as uh, passionate about his hatred of me uh, <laughs> in the same way. And um, but again, had he not critiqued me, I probably wouldn't have. Um, I wouldn't have learned. I wouldn't have made the curve uh, so quickly. I needed yeah. a reference point. It would it would I have liked it to be a little softer and gentler, <laughs> of course. But you know, the fact that it came is a blessing in and of itself, and um, it helped me be. You know, I love comics, and I don't think anybody. Um, I don't think anybody does gets into comics for the money because there's not a lot of money in comics. So you got to love it, and. Yeah. To me, I just always wanted beyond writing the comics and having stories that I wanted to tell. I just love being part of this community. It's like it's really great people within the community. And, you know, unfortunately, I don't think many of us are going to get out of this life alive. And <laughs> if you can if you can go on this journey and you can find folks to sort of roll with you and you're enjoying it as you go, um, Regardless of what's happening in the reality of my life, it's great to know that I can, you know, go to Twitter or go wherever. And there's a bunch of folks who um, love something and something that I may love as well, or they may love my work or whatever. And we're all part of this big community. And um, the fact that I create comics, I write comics, doesn't separate me from being a fan of comics. You know, I'm still a part of it as well. And I think we're all on equal footing. And so, you know, again, it's just an honor to be part of the community. Yeah. You know, I could, you know, as we're as we're we're hitting the hour mark here, so I don't want to keep you too long, Rodney. But um, oh, I'm good. I, I want to okay. see Steve Wilkos at four thirty. Um, I think that there's a case that he's working on uh, that I, but I may have DVR'd it. So other than that, you're good. Just keep going. <laughs> Good. Awesome, awesome. Yeah. So, I mean, there's there's a ton of threads that you can pull on when you're reading Philadelphia. Uh, we talked about the father son relationship. Um, you know, one of my one of my favorite characters in the book is, of course, Tevin. You know, Tevin Tompkins Seesaw. Mm -hmm. um, as I'm reading this, I'm thinking. I, I guess what I, my favorite part that I enjoy is how he. I consider him a like a free thinker, right? He 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 was a uh, he was with John Adams, you know, he's, he's, you know, part of, part of the team basically with John Adams is his agenda, what he's trying to do. Of course, John Adams is trying to improve a system that he thinks is flawed. Right. And, and it really brought to my mind like this, 
how our country is, right? Like we are constantly trying to replace leaders with other leaders um, that have new ideas. And many times it's just more, more of the same thing and just different ideas. But what happens when you actually break that system and just be free, right? And, and that's kind of the, what I got out of Kevin, like just the fact that he's a free thinker. He finally got that concept where he's, he's free of, of, let's just do away with the system and let's just be free. Um, and I think I just, I kind of want to just hear what you, what you have to yeah. say about that. Am I on the right track with that? You're on an excellent track with that. I think the big thing to me was, you know, before he was given immortality and perspective, uh, he was just a regular guy. And I remember at one time I was going to make him like a, a prominent figure of his time. And I was like, no, just make him a regular guy because Oftentimes when you're trying to struggle to survive, you're not taking, um, you don't see yourself as living. You see yourself as trying to survive, to pay your bills or take care of your responsibilities, but you don't realize you're going through life as you're doing it. And once, you know, now it's not so much an idea of survival. Now I've got immortality. Um, what do I do with it? And you've got John Adams saying, do this. And it doesn't feel completely right. It doesn't suit you. So it's like, okay, your thinking differs from my thinking. Does that make my thinking wrong? So initially you follow him because he was a president and he is their leader. But after a while, your thoughts start screaming in your head and they had merit as well. And then you get to a point where you say, you know what? I want to do my own thing. And uh, I want to give that a try. And I don't think enough people, if you look at any chain, you look at any of the innovators over history, they were usually people who thought outside of the box. They were usually people who didn't necessarily march to the beat of the status quo, and they figured out their own way of being. And I think once you can do that, you're on the path of something really, really good. And I'm not saying that's the path that I'm on, but I aspire to be in a place where I'm thinking more freely and not so much like what I'm sort of told or how I'm told to think. Um, so yeah, he represents that. I love that. Mm. Man, that, that's, that, and that's, that, that's exactly what I, like, what I felt like I got out of it. Um, uh, something else. Um, I mean, reading this book, I think, there's also that aspect of like the power of humanity coming together in a crisis, right? Like Philadelphia is being destroyed or Philadelphia is being destroyed and you have to have people come together. Uh, what you have there at the end with Jimmy and, and James and then, uh, and you have the whole, uh, Josie, it's Josie, right? Because yes. So right? So, um, so that's, that's another powerful aspect of the book, right? When, when humanity's faced with un, uh, insurmountable odds, how we come together to face, uh, to face these things. Um, and sometimes it takes a crisis, um, uh, to do that. Right. So, um, I think right now as a world, we're facing the pandemic that we all have in common, you know, we're all facing all this, this, uh, it's, it's been a crazy year. I know everybody, I mean, everybody's well aware of that. Um, yeah. So it's, again, a Stephen King, it's a Stephen King kind of year. It's like a little <laughs> bit of everything, but yeah, it, it really is. It, it really is. It's crazy. Um, so as I, again, I'm reading this book. It offers that aspect of, of hope, right? When we come together to to defeat an obstacle. Um, so again, just I'm just throwing stuff out there, but it's just um, it's powerful. And there was a lot of moments where I I'm I'm I'm, I'm following a thread and I follow another thread. But at the end of it, it's like, I love that you're writing, uh, you're talking about hope, you're talking about, um, you know, thinking, thinking free, um, all these really good uh, characteristics. So uh, again, that's just, that's just another uh, kudos to you. Um, just as I, as I'm, as I'm gushing over it here. No, um, thank you. I really appreciate it. It's like, uh, I'm amazed sometimes that um, people even take the time to dig that deeply into the work but the intention behind it is uh, is to find the real stuff. It's like, um, who are we as people? Um, uh, why do we do the things that we do? You know, I, I'm always fascinated. America is a great experiment. 
you know, trying to, to take people from different walks of life and sort of cram us together in a nation and yeah. seeing whether or not we can get along. And you have tribal dynamics, you have um, a lot of different ways that people look at um, how they want to live their lives and can that work? And I think right now that idea is being put to the test and being able to write about it, you know, in, in, a, in a graphic novel, sort of, I, I think of guys like Ray Bradbury and um, George Orwell and, uh, you know, just guys who really were able to speak about the period of time that they were in. And I want to, take a crack at speaking about the time that we're in right now, which I think is a very unique period of time. I think we'll look back on it and go, wow, you know, did we not go outside for like eight months? And, you know, was there a race war in between while we were not going outside? And, um, you know, everything that you could imagine is being thrown at America. But there's something about it, just the idea of what America is that makes me believe that we'll get out of this and, Hopefully we'll get out of it in a stronger state than we entered it. And, um, you know, oftentimes uh, I think I put this line in there too when I was talking about how uh, sometimes it takes um, struggle, you know, and hardship in order for people to really appreciate what they have. I know it has for me. Um, and so trying to figure out that place where, where you see character come up, um, the good stuff rise up. You know, I think about like 9-11 and just different periods of times where Americans came together and figured out a way to bond. I just think, you know, we need to figure it out past the spectacle, past the big event thing. How can on a day-to-day -day basis we figure out how to be um, a little bit kinder, a little bit more connected, a little bit more empathetic to each other? Um, I realize it's easier said than done. And I realize my life hasn't been a straight line and I haven't always been my best self. But the goal at the end of the day is to figure out how you can pull that stuff out of yourself. And I look at Philadelphia as being an aspect of that. Um, there's a Philadelphia spinoff in the works and um, trying to figure out, you know, that same thing, figuring out another aspect of um, how people take trauma and do good things with it. Um, those are the types of stories that I want to tell. Uh, speaking of, of, you know, the future of Philadelphia. Uh, I did have a question about, uh, there's a mention in the book of, uh, you know, possibly uh, reversing being a vampire. Uh, are we going to get a little, a little bit of a backstory on what happened with oh, that? Yeah. Oh, yeah. yeah. Okay. Well, there's everything, you know, everything that seems like it's just a one-off and wait a minute, is that something that's like, yeah, yeah there'll be a full story. Yes, it's there. I'm so excited. Um, <laughs> you know, it's the same thing with um, seesaw and magic. You know, it, that came from uh, the book that was given to John Adams in um, issue mm. three. It's like there's never, there's nothing that's just there as a throwaway. Um, you know, yeah. there's some, there's some big things coming in arc two, uh, big characters that are coming in arc two that I don't think. Uh, people will see coming, but um, hopefully it'll be a lot of fun. Yeah, that is so exciting, though. Man. Yeah, that that kind of leads. We actually had leading us to a question here. Um, so, talking, speaking about the book that was discovered in the Caribbean, uh, I, I guess we're going to find out a little bit more about that and about the book itself and the people who put the book together. Ah, man, mm -hmm. I can't wait, man. So. Yeah. There's a lot okay. of yeah, mind blown. Uh, <laughs> how many, how many more issues? I mean, I, I know you can't predict. No, I, exactly. I've got, I've got five arcs planned in my head. Yes, what you've already read, and I'm toying with another idea. I haven't. Um, I got to talk to Jason about it, but um, there'll at least be five arcs of Philadelphia and um, the spinoff is ongoing and there's another book that Jason and I are doing as well. So um, there's a lot of, there's a lot of uh, stuff coming from the Barnes Alexander uh, next six months or so. I know you don't, of course you don't, you're not going to tell us, but in your head, do you have an ending for this book? Kind of something. Um, 
not so much an ending. I don't want it to be. Um, it's not one of those things like The Walking Dead. You know yeah. where you could have zombies forever, um, and that's not necessarily a bad thing. I'm just saying the nature of having an antagonist that can speak and is, can think and do that lends itself to a definitive conclusion for me uh, that something has to end at some point. I don't have it in my head yet because I'm enjoying the journey so much. Um, yeah. I don't want it to end anytime soon. I know that all things. Me either. There was this. Um, there was this show, Homicide: Life on the Street, that uh, I loved growing up, and um, it was the basically it was the Wire, but the network TV version of the Wire, and um, Giancarlo Esposito. I was working on a movie uh, as a production assistant, and uh, he was there, and he played one of the characters in the show in the latter part, and they had just canceled the show, and I was heartbroken. And he said, uh, don't worry about it, man. You know, all good things come to an end. There'll be something else. And I remember wanting to punch him when he said that. But <laughs> he was absolutely right. There's always something else that comes that yeah. uh, is just as good, if not better. But for right now, uh, I'm really digging the Philadelphia world. And, um, you know, I want to go deeper. I want to go deeper with it and, and – um, yeah, well, I'm good. Cathartic, so yeah. I'm good with the next ten years of Philadelphia, man. I'm good. I'm ready. <laughs> From your lips to God's ears. Hopefully that becomes the case, yeah. and then hopefully if the TV show becomes a reality, um, you know the two can walk together. Man, that yeah, that would be amazing. I'm yeah. <laughs> um, Dave. Coletta in the chat uh, asks, will there be a soundtrack, I guess, for Philadelphia? Oh, yeah. Uh, yeah. Yep, there'll be a soundtrack. Um, uh, man, I can't give it away. I'd love to give it away, but I'm writing the script right now. And um, I could say a lot of the music is uh, feels like Philadelphia. You know, it's um, – I think music is an important part of, you know, any um, – TV show, movie, whatever, to help tell the story. And um, it was funny. I was talking to um, a friend of mine, uh, Max Borenstein, partners on uh, the, the Lakers show that I'm doing. And we were talking about The Sopranos and how much music played a part in, uh, you know, just when you heard that song in the beginning, in the opening yeah. of Sopranos, yeah. it kind of put you in New Jersey and it put you in danger. Yeah. And I want this to feel like that as well. I want it to feel like Philadelphia. I want it to feel... Um, all of the themes that you've been talking about, hope, um, fear, uh, redemption, salvation, I want the music to reflect that, but also to help guide the story through as well. So, yeah. That's awesome. Man. I do have, I, I had a question earlier that I kind of passed by, but do you have a, do you have something that kind of gives you inspiration when you're writing? Do you, do you listen to music? Do you walk? Do you, do you have like a um, go-to thing? Yeah, man, it's a, it's according to how much anxiety I'm feeling at the moment. It's like um, it always takes me a moment to settle down because uh, the blank page is terrifying. So I usually need an hour or so of silence so that I can get rid of the noise that's in my head. And mm -hmm. then... Um, then music sometimes uh, in the background. What I used to do was there are about maybe 15 films that I love uh, with all my heart. And I would put them on in the background with the sound down. And every once in a while, I would look up and be able to see something that moved me and inspired me and made me want to do this. And so whenever I want to quit a story or mm. give up earlier in the day than I should, I could look up and see a Hitchcock film or I could, you know, Apocalypse Now or whatever. And, um, well, keep awesome. going. you know, so I'd say those two things. Man. Man. <laughs> That's uh, good stuff. <laughs> Swing so now you're for the fences here, guys. I'm trying to do great work. Try. Yeah, no, we, we love it. We're, man, we're excited. We're thrilled to be on the, on the train. Um, so, so now that you've got, you know, Philadelphia, you've got some some comics that you, you know, some su 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 yeah, some success has been building up. Uh, would you like to return, dive back into some some of the big two characters at any point? 
Uh, yeah, I, I'm I'm going to do a one shot. I can't tell you what it is for Marvel uh, coming up soon. Um, uh, so yes, would be the answer. I mean, I would love to do uh, one of those black label books with Jason. Oh, I've got a Swamp Thing Nightwing story that I'd love to tell. And um, I would love to do Swamp Thing. Oh my God, with some Rodney Barnes, yeah. man. man, I'm in. <laughs> it's my favorite character, man. I mean, I love, I love the Bernie Wrightson when uh, when run, and I love the Alan Moore run, and. Um, and most of them in between. Nancy Collins did once. Not Scott Snyder. It's like there's so many. It's, he's such a great character that um, mm -hmm. I'd love to take a crack at him. Um, and just to say that I did and to tell a story. Stories kind of ferment in your head for me. It's like they live there and they won't leave you alone until you get it out of your system. And Philadelphia was kind of that. Yeah. And the Swamp Thing idea, I would love to be able to get out of my system too. And uh a couple of, a couple of shows ago, we had talked about uh, older stories that we would redo with a new artist, and that Swamp Thing Alamore was one of my picks. I would, I love the story, uh, but for me, I'm a big art person. That's what really captures me in a book. So to see mm -hmm. some, you uh, like a didn't story. like the total bin? You didn't like the art of in Swamp Thing? No, or... I, I did. I did. I it's there. I. I like the uh, Jason Alexander type stuff though a lot, you know. So I can imagine yeah. Swamp Thing with that kind of art would blow my mind. Jason, you know? Jason would kill Swamp Thing. I mean, Jason would, especially since he's that kind of character and he's in the boggy swamps of you know Louisiana. So it's like being able to draw that stuff isn't really that far removed from the way that he approaches Philadelphia. It's a lot of shadows. It's a lot of darkness. It's a lot of mystery just you know in the tone of how he approaches story so i think he would be phenomenal on swamp thing yeah <laughs> man so rodney i know uh, everybody in the chat is you know huge philadelphia fans we're we're on board uh, i can thanks I can, guys I can, I can speak for most of the people in our in the community in the chat when we say that we're just like somebody said earlier, anything that has your name on it, we're gonna go. We're gonna buy that book, and whatever the cost is, four ninety nine, five ninety nine, where we're in. But uh, you do have some other stuff that is is coming up. But I would love for you to plug anything that you want to. I know I heard about the Tiger Woods uh, series that you're gonna do, and the Lakers. You know, tell it. Yeah, tell us I've, got it, um, I've got. Do I have the art? I don't. I've got so much stuff in this messy office. Um, I've got a monster movie uh, I'm doing with uh, director Jordan Voigt Roberts, who did Kong Skull Island, uh, that I'm writing for New Regency. I have the Tiger Woods miniseries um, that I'm writing. I have um, this Philadelphia TV show that I'm writing. Um, the Lakers uh, show, we don't have a title yet. We've been saying Showtime because the name of the book is Showtime uh, for H. HBO right now, um, a bunch of other stuff that they probably want me to talk about. But there's another movie for Disney, and um, this is like maybe seven or eight different things. Um, and then you know, in the world of comics, uh, I think I've got three series, three different series with Jason uh, and another artist. Um, I think you guys are going to love within the next, like I said, six months. So it's a, it's a busy time. I mean, I hate the pandemic, but I don't mind being trapped in my office to get some of the stuff done. Cause you know, in real life, I get distracted a lot. You know, I procrastinate a lot and I find ways to uh, figure out how not to work. But, um, Oh, it's true. You know, I know that it'll never be as good in my head as it is on paper. Mm -hmm. um, so, and the, the, the instrument in between, the problem is me. So it's a daunting task to get me to sit down and um, to get it done. But being forced to get it done, uh, like I said, I hate that the world's going through what it's going through and that people are hurting, but um, it's forcing me to be in my office and get more work done. So... I guess if there's a silver lining to a really bad scenario, um, that's it. That is awesome. Um, Nick in the chat says, wait, 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 go back. Did he say through three new series with Jason? Three new series with Jason. Um, 
One is a Philadelphia spinoff, one is a miniseries, and the other one is a short that may be in the back of the Philadelphia, the next arc of Philadelphia. Man. Yeah, we got we got plenty to come, man. I'm so excited. Man. Hey, and it's because of you guys. I mean, the enthusiasm that you guys show, um, I'm sure Image hears it. Um, uh, uh, yes, you will, Nick. I, I, I'd love to be able to do it, but I think you tell. I'm, I'm on the verge of telling, and I actually know. Um, yeah. I think the enthusiasm that the fans have shown um, to, you know, the world and to Image, you know, opens the door for us to be able to do other things, and I couldn't be more grateful to so for everybody that says I'm so great because of interacting with you guys again it's an honor interacting with you guys it's an honor to be able to be part of a community that you know like I said you guys help create it all we can do is do the work but you guys feed it and nurture it and um, all we have to do is just keep doing our best work and hopefully you guys will dig it absolutely yeah somebody right had a, a question about the pretzel um, that was Jason's idea of how you eat a pretzel. I just want to say it wasn't my idea. That's certainly not how I eat pretzel, but that was Jason's idea of how you eat a pretzel. So, hey. Again, Rodney, just want to tell you thank you so much, man. This has been just absolutely fantastic. I feel like we are we vibe together, man. Like we, uh, This is just I told you guys, there's a job waiting for you, just as my PR people, uh, and I don't have PR people, but when it's time to get some PR people, I'm hiring you guys, you've got the intro music, you've got all of the stuff, you've got Tom Hanks working with you, you got the Flash, yeah. you've got four generations removed, but yeah, it's sad. <laughs> I, I want to be with you guys, I want to yeah, come man. on and be calls with you guys. Man, we're, 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 in, we're, man. we're in. in. We can, man, so. <laughs> got it. Uh, so just, just before we let you go, I just want to show you, uh, you are officially on the Lost in Comics uh, Wall of Fame now. I don't know if you've seen uh, this or not, Hall of Fame. And there uh -oh. you are, dead center in the middle. Man, so, thank you. Thank you yeah. very much. I appreciate that. And again, don't you know, from us. When somebody, when somebody <laughs> bigger comes, don't take me down and move me like to the, you know, no. downtown on the board, like in the corner or something. No, no, you no. No, no. <laughs> no your, your, place, your place is planted on there, uh, Rodney. Again, uh, thank you. Thank you so much. And I can't, can't say thank you enough. And keep up the great work. We love it. And uh, thank you. I'm going to do my best, guys. I really appreciate you a lot. And um, I appreciate all the fans that love the book. And, um, Happy to do it again whenever you guys are ready. Oh man, awesome. we, we, yeah, can't say it enough, man. You, you've you've really made the uh, bucket list for me uh, and Chris, and uh, you know we're just super excited that you would even grace us with uh, coming on and talking about. And you're just so humble, and it just it's just yeah. crazy, man. But I can't wait to to see what you got coming up. And thank you so much, man. So <laughs> you guys will know first. I'll make sure I let you guys know before the world does. Oh man, you are the best. <laughs> Yeah. We will we will see you next time. All sure. right, guys. You take it easy. All right, sir. You have a good one. Thank you. Oh, man. Whoa. Whoa. How about uh no. Rodney Barnes for president 2024? Well, I, was was that. <laughs> I was gonna Rodney say that. I was gonna say that about the whole world, bro. Yeah. Barnes 2024. Man, dude. I'll, incredible, I'll man. Push. <laughs> Incredible. Let's take a quick little uh, break while we gather our thoughts. And let's let's uh, take a quick intermission here. People keep asking if I'm back. I'm back to tell you one thing, and that's to follow these guys at Lost in Comics. If you don't, I'm coming for you, and I'm going to kill each and every one of you. <laughs> Thank you, man. All sorts of guests today, man. Yeah, we're 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 lucky, bro. We're lucky. Yeah. If if Keanu so, is telling saying he's gonna kill people, I I would go right now. Make sure you like the video if you haven't done so already. If you like enjoyed the interview with Rodney, uh, make sure you like the video. And if you haven't subbed to our channel, hit the sub button. I don't know what you're waiting for. This is the place to get lost in comics. And do that right now. Um, Man, I don't Tell have the word. Huh? 
I'm just saying, go tell one friend, just one person that doesn't know about us. Tell one person and get them to sub to us. That's all we Let's need. Tell one person. Let's get some more people. We're gonna have more interviews. We're gonna have Rodney back on at some point. Um, dude, I, I couldn't be more excited and thrilled with talking to Rodney, dude. That was exceeded my expectations, and my expectations were this high, you know. Um, and just talking to Rodney, dude, I'm like, dude, we, I could, I could just listen to him for. I could probably do like a whole, you know, just the whole day just listening to him. That was incredible, man. Incredible. Woo, Bro, five, man. five four arcs at least of Philadelphia. Uh, I couldn't have heard anything better. From him, yeah. so that's that's pretty awesome, man. I'm I'm super excited, but uh, you know, the show must so, keep going. So let's do the something. Show must, the show must go on. So yesterday, guys, was of course New Comic Book Day, July fifteenth, and we had some good ones yesterday. Um, so man, let's just get right into it. Let's talk about some new comic books. What was that. your pick of the week for this week, Oscar? So my pick of the week before. Uh, you know, I like to I like to kind of show you what I read, just so you get the idea of of how hard it was to have a pick. Uh, so the, out of the books I picked up, real quick, I'm not gonna say much about them. Uh, Strange Adventures, uh, issue three. Uh, this Venom, uh, it's a, it's the beginning of a new arc. I wasn't gonna get it. I had said I wasn't gonna get Venom anymore, uh, but I picked it up, <laughs> and I'm I'm glad I did because it's. It's re- it's a really good it's a really good story. Uh, the art is fantastic as always. Uh, year wow. zero. Uh, did you read this? Yes, I did. Okay, real quickly. I, I, like I said, I'm, I'm going to go through this pretty quickly. But my problem with year zero right now is I feel like there's not enough. I mean, there's two issues left, and I feel like the individual story isn't enough. I want more. I want more of these stories and. I hope there's more after this issue five. I hope there's gonna be another arc, maybe, because there I need is. more of this, you know. So there is uh, there. Uh, Benjamin Percy, uh, I don't know, a week or two weeks ago, he did say that they have a second arc coming for yeah. Year Zero. So I, I feel the same way. I do want to say one thing about that book. It, it was on my list too. I read it yesterday. Um, the one thing about that book, I am loving the character story, and that's really what that book is becoming. It's a book about characters what's going yeah. on in the world. What I will say though, is I, I want some more, I want to know more about the world. Like what is go, like what exactly happened? We're getting like little tidbits, um, but it really is a, a story about the characters and what's going on all across the world, all around the world in different cultures, different uh, people, different mindsets. Um, so it, it is like a, an end of the world type of situation, but I do want to know a little bit for me personally, I like to know a little bit more about the world. What, what is happening in the world? Um, yeah. like, I mean, it, it has been three issues of, I feel like the same type of storytelling and it's good that the characters are definitely developing. I'm definitely, I've, I've grown an attachment to some of the characters and I feel invested, especially in the survivalist who, and he's like in this issue, uh, he's, he meets, Somebody on he's the, on I the think CB, he's <laughs> yeah, he meets somebody on the CB radio, and he's uh, he's all excited. He's he's locked in his house, and he's actually willing to take the journey out of the house for, of course, for a female, right, for love. So, um, <laughs> it, I think it's a fantastic book. But I I do I did want to say that that I I just hope very soon. I'm sure we will toward the end of the arc we get something just slammed on us, thrown in our face about what exactly cause this and what where are we going with it aside from yeah. the character work so but I, I thought it was a great book yeah you're correct man uh next one up is once in future issue nine bro if you're not reading this uh you got to get on this man uh, with the trade or on digital or something but this this book i really wanted to like make it my pick uh so these last couple books these are like my honorable mentions because these, these were my like, difficult the artists the colors are fantastic in this book the the story is just it's mind blowing, man. Uh, I really enjoy the this. Uh, and then I read the Death Metal and uh, Nightwing. Read Nightwing. That one was up there. It's a hard choice as well. Uh, this one would have been. Uh, this one I really wanted to make my pick. Uh, so this is like the big honorable mention. Undone by Blood. Uh, this book, man, it's it's really getting uh, really getting good. Uh, but like I said, I'm not gonna say too much about these books. These are just, these are just you know something. You should, if you're not reading the, any of these, look into it. But my pick of the week is uh, Red Border. Man, man, oh, man. Like my grandma used to say all the time, man, oh, man. 
yeah. Red Border Three by Jason Starr, Will Conrad. Uh, slap me so, with that book. Say what? So slap me with that book, bro. <laughs> here, here, look. I, I love that book, bro. Man. So this, so uh, a, a quick recap, right? Uh, so the the whole issue starts with uh, a family getting butchered pretty much by the cartel. Uh, a, a guy and his girlfriend, they they they're able to escape and they they make a run for the border. And when they get to the border, uh, the cartel ca- kind of catches up to them at the same time. And there's somebody at the border that's who's escaping as well and who helps them to get o- get across. And they run into these these. I mean, I don't want to sound bad but in the book they're like country country folk you know what i mean they're 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 i guess red i don't i don't rednecks i don't know what they are anyways uh but oh, they want to get off my land get off my land hey, you better not you better not <laughs> and but they want to they you know they want them getting saved uh they want to killing that the whole group of cartel people and they're taking to the taking to this house and this house it reminds me of a very texas chainsaw massacre Type of family, you know, but they're very subtle about it, you know. But yeah. in this issue, uh, I know they alluded to it in the last issue, but in this issue, when they're they're they find the den, and in this den, there's like we like like you and I have all these comic stuff. These people got like heads and bodies of taxidermy humans, and it. Yeah. Man, after I finished reading this, it stuck with me. Like I was trying to debate about other books, but this one just kept the art in it is really great. It's it's super eerie and. Uh, it just really gives you that that horror vibe, man. That that you want in a in a in a book. So, this was my pick. Uh, I really really enjoyed this book, and uh, yeah, that's that's me. So, man, uh, I just real quick, I want to say what's up to Hero and the Kid. Hero and the Kid is in the house. We are going to be on their channel on Sunday doing a sit down interview with Will. I'm super excited about that. Sunday five o'clock on Hero and the Kid YouTube channel. Um, Carl Moster said, awesome interview, guys. Very groovy. Groovy, baby. Um, <laughs> comic book poser says, you're, you're, that book is fire this week. I don't know. I don't know if I said that right. But, um, <laughs> dude, Red Border 2, dude, this is the, this is the horror comic that I've wanted in my life. Like, I've been searching for this type of comic. We, you and I always dabble in horror comics that come out, mm-hmm. and we've, we've done a lot, uh, especially Cullen Bunn. We've gotten into a lot of those books, yeah. and not, not to discredit any of those. Those are fantastic, but this one, dude, I really felt like the movie vibes, you know, like the way you said yeah. Chainsaw Massacre. Um, it's, it's a beautiful art, dude. I was looking at the art yesterday, and I was like, dude, this is like... I, to be completely honest, I don't, I've never heard of Will Conrad before this book, who's the artist on the book. I'm like, dude, this art is, that is fire, dude. I mean, look, look at the detail in the yeah. faces, the scenery. It's incredible. Um, and in this book, dude, I felt like I was watching a movie. I was on the edge of my seat. There were moments where I was like, oh, God, like, oh, crap. Like, you know, and yeah. it made me feel um, like scared for the family. And then I'm like, like anticipating, like, man, what's gonna happen next? And that's a sign of a good comic book. If you are into a horror, horror comics, you have to pick this up. Uh, I think it's unbelievable, and I'm kind of disappointed that this would only be four issues. It's, it says it's a four issue run. I'm hoping mm-hmm. I haven't heard heard anything on this one, but I'm hoping that there's more issues of this to come. Yeah. Uh, but Jason Starr and Will Conner are doing a, a fantastic uh, job on this on this book, and it's definitely a great uh, pick. And I knew there was something up with Tito, man. I knew it. That little, that little yeah. rat, man. I want, I don't want to spoil that, but man, yeah, I won't, I won't either. But the fact that he wasn't eating, eating tacos, bro. A Mexican not eating tacos. Come on, that's something fishy right there. I already knew. I already knew he's up to something. <laughs> yeah, yeah, man. And then, um, and then Eduardo, the husband, he's been getting all this grief from his wife, Karina. And then at the end, he he like does the ultimate sacrifice. And like, I'm not gonna say what that is, but he shows. How much he really loves her and i was like dude after all the crap she gave him man you know he goes yeah. and stands up for her like that and yeah if, you, if, if any of that sounds interesting to you guys if you like horror comics this is a must pick up uh, go pick it up if you haven't already um red border number two carl cheers all enjoy the rest of the show lost in comics you guys are killing it all my thumbs up carl yeah. man we love you carl you are Carl is our first love, and he he will always be our first love. 
the artist from Deceased and Killables in the house. Thank you so much, Carl. So for my pick of the week, um, my pick of the week was Dark Knight's Death Metal number two. And there, like you said, there was a lot of good books. Uh, I feel like a lot of books this week are kind of getting into the meat of some of the stories. So this one right here kind of hit hit home for me just because we're kind of still at the beginning. We're still getting a lot of the story developing. Um, all I'm going to say without too much spoilers is, okay, this is a spoiler. Five, <laughs> Do it. Four, three, two, one. Spoiler alert. The Batman who laughs, the Batman who laughs got cut in half, right? In the first issue, and in the second issue, right here, they take What's his brain. You, you gotta say with what? What did he get cut in half with? He got cut in half by Wonder Woman, right? With the invisible the chainsaw and yeah. the invisible chainsaw, <laughs> cuts him in half, and then in this issue, he gets. They take Batman. Of course, he couldn't be gone, or right? he couldn't be dead. Yeah. They take his yeah. brain and they put it into Doctor Manhattan's body, right? So he well, is he now, be... dude. He is now the Bat Manhattan who laughs. The Bat Manhattan who laughs. This issue is crazy. It's wild. Um, yeah. Kind of what you expect from a book called Death Metal. Um, and in this in this book, Diana convinces because. Because Bruce, Batman, he's totally not on board with yeah. trying to save the world. He thinks that maybe taking everybody off this, off the world, out of, out of this multiverse into another place is going to save them, which is a dangerous thing to even try. And Diana's of the thinking that you know what we we need to fight for we need to fight for our world. So she he finally buys in to Diana's idea, uh, and they're gonna they're gonna try one more time to save the world. And what feels like a helpless situation, they're going to go in. Um, and in order to do this, with the help of the Justice Society of America and Wally West, they must travel into the dark multiverse to the original crisis, steal the energy being funneled to Perpetua, and use it to power up Wally so he can destroy her and help restart the universe. It's a big task. That's it's planting the foundation, and we're going to see this play out. In the up upcoming issues, um, and at the very end, I love at the very end, right? They're taking this journey on this robot machine. Again, all credit, all credit to Batman because it's one of his contingency plans, right? He always has plans that are that are ahead, right? And people don't know about them, but they end up saving the world time and time again. He had uh, he had the Toy Master create a stealth machine that is a robot that is a culmination of all the, the you know batman wonder woman superman in this big giant machine and they're going to fly this thing uh into <laughs> into uh the dark multiverse and they like i love i love the book man i'm i'm, I'm so excited about it yeah that that, that was a, a book that i battled with as well uh, i just because i love the characters there's so many good characters in there uh yeah. once once uh the Batman, or what? What is he called now? Uh, uh, Bat Manhattan who laughs. Bat Manhattan who laughs. Bro, he had no mercy. He just like wiped out like everybody, yeah. I mean, like even his own people. And I, I'm just thinking to myself. First of all, it kind of was crazy that Doctor Manhattan didn't make it through the bat through the first battle. You know, I'm thinking yeah. to myself, he's pretty powerful. Like for him to be not even be around, that's pretty crazy. You know, but. It is. It is. The brain, man. The brains on Batman, bro. You know, it's crazy. It's crazy, crazy. But it's a good pick. Great art, man. So, yeah, awesome. And that, I think, definitely my runner-up would have been Red Border number two. Uh, I can't can't say enough about that book. Um, and I read Nightwing seventy-two. Fantastic That's a good book. That one is great. You're getting the the uh, kind of some of the story. With the Joker, uh, what's leading up to the Joker Wars? That is amazing stuff. Um, yeah, man, great, great, great week in comics, which uh, leads us to the Lost in Comics family pick of the week. All right, all right. I just got Everybody, y'all, y'all stay here, man. Why are people? Oh, who's it? 
Iron What's up? Man. What's up, Tony? Stop playing with your toys. Man. <laughs> yeah. I had to show it off real quick. Um. Uh, uh, Nick, what, we'll see you later, Nick. He's got to go. See you later, man. Uh, Peace out, Nick. Y'all stay right here. We're almost done with the show, but we got to talk about this. Uh, your pick. Boston, your pick. Every week, we put a Twitter poll out. You guys did an awesome job voting this week. We had 94 votes this week. Um, and the options were, were Snake Eyes, Dead Game, number one. It Eats What It Feeds, number one. Transformers, 84, number one. And Engine Ward, number one. And with a whopping 64%, it eats what it feeds, number one. Won that. And that is by Scout Comics writer Max Holden and Aaron Crow, art by Gabriel Lumazark. So, uh, you want to start on this? What, what, did, what did you think? Man, I, I loved it. Okay. Me too. So, I, I love the mystery in it. I love I love that it gives you – this. this is written very well because it gives you just enough just yeah. enough to be interested, just enough to like keep you guessing at what's happening. Uh, the way that uh, you know how I always talk about the art, right? Mm -hmm. Through the panels, you know, uh, like look at the shading in that, like when she's walking off, like the shadows, great use of shadows in the art. Um, I just, I just think it's pretty. It's, it's really good. So there's something obviously going on. Doesn't really tell you what exactly. Um, you know, the art, the art was done pretty well. Uh, this, this lady, I don't know what her deal is, but. Uh, you know she's she's drawn in a, in a very good way in a, in a very cool way and yeah you know we'll we'll see what's going on with her but I'm definitely I'm definitely interested I, I think I'm gonna continue to get this I'm gonna sub to this I I, I really did enjoy it I really liked it a lot what did you think um, I liked it a lot uh, just before we get any further real quick I just want to do the let's do the code word right now for Lost in Comics family feedback at the end of the show we'll have I don't know one or two people come on let's say two if we get it. Um, and we'll just let's try to keep it at two to three minutes uh, this week. But if anybody wants to talk about the Rodney Barnes interview or uh, anything that we're talking about right now in the chat right now, we'll put the keyword Philadelphia, keyword Philadelphia, and we'll get you on here. As long as you follow us on social media, we'll send you a link to come into the chat here at, at the end of the show just to talk for a couple of minutes. So it eats what it feeds. What were you Real quick. Say? I yeah. just wanted to mention that the the story and and uh, this girl in the what she's doing like playing with this kid's head, you know, yeah. uh, makes all the made all the funny parts kind of tingle. <laughs> <laughs> you know what, um, comic book poser, he said this scout book is the graduate equals a horror movie. I <laughs> couldn't agree more, dude. Like this um, this book was it was fun. Um, it's a simple. It felt like a simple story. It was like one of those refreshing type of books. I've been wanting to get into a good scout comic. I've read a couple of them, but um, this is a simple story about a young dude named Kenny, and he stumbles upon an ad in the newspaper for a handyman, and the address is six 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 nine 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 McPike <laughs> Lane in Bestune, Louisiana. So I mean, the ad alone is like suspicious already. But he replies yes. to the ad. And he, he drives up to this place and it's all foggy and the place looks like it's haunted, you know, it looks crazy. Um, he's met by a beautiful woman in a red dress who describes the perfect job, right? He's, she's like, you know, I just need you to basically take care of the place. I need you to mow the grass, but you're gonna get to eat for free because I'm gonna cook dinner. I prefer to cook dinner. Um, you're gonna get your own place outside. You have a place to stay. So you're gonna get free room, uh, free room and board, free food. And I'm going to give you $500 a week. This is a young guy, young dude. Um, it's like, what could be better, right? So he, he, yeah. even though he's getting like all the, uh, all he, uh, he's getting all these weird vibes walking into the house and it looks scary. He goes up to, he, he opens the kitchen and there's like, there's like bloody parts, right? Like in the kitchen yeah. or, or just blood every, you know, blood in the kitchen. And she kind of like takes him out of the kitchen. Like, Hey, don't go in there. Um, so he, he even was very distracted. <laughs> yeah, he's totally distracted. He's seduced. Um, yeah. This this totally made me feel like, dude, it made me take me back to like when I was like 15, 16, 17, 18 years old, where you're just like, whatever, like whatever it takes, man, like I'll be distracted no matter what um, by a female. And I thought this was, uh, like I said, it made me feel that, like I felt like a kid, you know, again, <laughs> reading this yeah. book. 
Um, so we don't know, like she's cooking something up in that kitchen, right? We don't, we don't know what that is. It's a mystery, but it's, it's, it's really good. Um, I like this book a lot and I would definitely recommend anybody to go read this book. I know that, uh, um, the writer of this book, um, Aaron Crow, he, he, uh, actually retweeted our lost in comics family pick of the week and asked people to vote. I know he's trying to get eyes on it, so I, I give it the endorsement. I'm glad you liked it, so we can put the official Lost in Comics stamp on it. I go pick up this book. I'm adding it to my pull list, and so yeah. should you. So should you out there. Kind of like uh, kind of like, like Poser when he's like, you should read this. <laughs> you should read this. Yeah. I want you. So... <laughs> Um, are we, we're going to get, we got two people on or two people coming in right? Pixar and, and Poser here in a minute. Yeah. I, um, sent the, I sent it out to, uh, to them. So yeah, if you want to do the question, the, the trivia, go for it. Yeah. Um, so, free digital code for Venom issue number is it 26, 26. Yes. Correct. One that just came out uh, this Wednesday, we're going to give a free digital code to whoever answers this trivia question. What year did Venom make his first appearance in comics? Very simple question. What simple. year did simple. Venom make his first appearance in comics? First person to answer that question in the chat will get that free digital code that we will send to them Go. after the show. Go. Woo. Let's see. Let's see. Come on, guys. Come on. I don't see it. I don't see it. You Joe, see it? Joe, Joe's almost there. He said 87. Almost there, Joe. Not quite. Oh. Not quite. Not quite. Nat says 83. No. Oh, Jen mm -hmm. says 1883. No, come on, Nat. Come on. Come on, girl. <laughs> um, Joe's 93. Poser 84. Man, you guys are going dancing around it. Random one, 89. Oh, man. You guys are killing me. Close. You're getting close. You're getting close. He's not. He's not all to do. <laughs> no. 88. No, he, he threw his lunch out already. <laughs> Poser, congratulations. You have won. Venom, number 26. Digital code giveaway. That's awesome, man. When he gets on here, I'm going to break his ball a little bit because I don't think he should get it. He's over here throwing all kinds <laughs> of numbers. Like he didn't even know. <laughs> part of, yeah, when you're part of the family, man, how can you be? You're, you're taking from the family. You're taking from the family. But, uh, dude, I've had such fun. a um, let's let's talk to a couple of people before we get yeah. off and let's put a bow on the show. We, we, got Pixar. we got Pixar up. Pixar. Pixar? Is he oh. looking at the ground there? Uh, I'm in the show. <laughs> hey. What happened? Can you, guys, can you guys hear me okay? Yeah, yeah, yeah. I thought you were going to try and win the Venom. What, what's up? I just wanted to show everyone this. <laughs> Ah, the coveted, coveted Teen Titans 44. That was our 500 sub given to Fred. That's beautiful. Oscar's That's got a awesome, timer man. on you. That's awesome, man. I'm glad. Oh, great. What else? I'm, I'm a little mad that you did the Venom thing while I was gone. So. <laughs> uh, it's all good, man. What else did you I wasn't able to pick up Venom this week, but. Yeah. You don't sub to it? I would have thought you would have sub to it. So, um, I wanted to show you something. Since right. you guys sent me these here, <laughs> I figured <laughs> I'm going to send you this. That's nice. Awesome. Yeah. So, I don't That's know if the cool, lighting's dude. real good on that. But, Big Star, you're the man, man. You're the man, man. That's cool, man. Very cool. Very I cool, I, man. I, I, I love the color. I know. I'm more of a red, a red guy. You know, more of a, more of a Raphael. But yeah, he looks cool. Uh, Anyways, um, <laughs> before I go, have you guys read Empire yet? We, I picked up the Zero issue. Didn't care for it to be honest, but you know. Did you guys read it? No, I, I didn't pick up the new issue. No. How was it? Any good? It's actually pretty good. I was expecting it to be like 
based on the number of tie-ins that they have for it, I was expecting yeah. it to be pretty mediocre, but it was it's a pretty good first issue. I can't ever so, get into the Fantastic yeah. Four. I don't know what it is about them. I I don't know if it's because I'm a newer comic book guy or what, but I can never seem to get into them. I don't know what it is. Oh. Don't hate me, guys. Okay, just saying. <laughs> yeah, I definitely I want to give it a shot, man, because I I just I, I don't want to read it. Part of me doesn't want to read it, but part of me hears people talking about it, and I'm like, I don't want to miss something. So I feel like I need to read at least issue number one just to make a good you know judgment call on it. So, but yeah, yeah that's awesome. I'm glad you I'm glad you've got it, and maybe that 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 makes me want to get it for sure, man. So you know we're gonna put up that slab. You're gonna put it up in your in your room or by your by your art stuff. What are you gonna do with that slab? Did we lose him? <laughs> okay, I, I have to go now. Um, <laughs> All right, right. <laughs> Pixar. We'll see, you, see you later, Pixar. Thank you for gracing us with your presence, man. <laughs> Pixar, man. Bro, he family just, member. <laughs> the lock. I don't know. I hope he didn't get mad that I didn't that I didn't like it or didn't read it. He's like, that's it. I gotta go. I'm out of here. <laughs> so. guy, I'm tired of the Oscar. You, know, yeah. you didn't know, you don't like Venom because I do. Hey, uh, <laughs> Nat says she's got to get going. We'll see you later, Nat. Thank you Peace. for being in here. Thank you for being part of the family and having our time with Rodney today. We will see you on the Twitter. All I'm right, let's bring him in. Bring that guy in. Bring that guy in. Three minutes. Go. Go, go. Where is he? Is he there? Is he frozen? Poser. He's frozen in time. He's playing games, man. He's playing games with us. <laughs> Stop playing games. Oh, here he goes. Look. Poser, are you there? Poser, are you there? You ran out of time. <laughs> You better hurry up. Uh, I'm gonna. I'm gonna. You know. <laughs> I don't know what happened. I'm refreshing. Oh, wow. I see him on here right. twice. He's got like two. <laughs> Come on. Maybe man. he's on his computer and his phone, whichever one's gonna work. Uh, I guess before. Yeah. Let's see. There you go. Whoa! Hold on. There he is. <laughs> I can't. You got two minutes. Man. Oh. You got two minutes. Hurry up. <laughs> Uh, so here's my impression of me during that whole interview. <laughs> of me? Me. <laughs> oh, uh, yeah. That was that was fire, and he's he's very very interesting. I was excited to hear a lot of the stories he was willing to share with everybody. Isn't it exciting what he's yeah. got coming up, man? Yeah. And I mean to know that uh, there. What it issue the first arc was six issues, so to know that he's got at least 30 more planned out, like I'm excited, and you know, the hype's only going to continue to grow, especially with the TV show, because people who didn't read it will yeah. be introduced to something new. But yeah, it was a fire interview, and now I'm going to pester the shit out of him on Twitter to see <laughs> what it will take to get him to write an Adam Warlock book. <laughs> the moment he said warlock, I was like, well, I love you even more. <laughs> Make yeah. it happen, man. I, but, yeah. I felt the same way, Poser. Like I was when he was talking, I was just it's almost it's almost difficult to keep conversating and asking questions when you're just in awe of what he's talking about. Uh, you I'm should go like, back and oh. watch the chat on rewind because there are yeah. just moments where it's dead for like five minutes <laughs> and then uh, like Everybody will take a breath, and then you'll you will have asked him a question, and then the chat will wake up and say like three thousand things, and then just dead silent again. It's I've not seen anything like that before. Yeah, everybody uh, was really really caught up with him, man. So yeah, uh, in terms of busting my balls over the the venom answer, <laughs> technically in nineteen eighty four. There is an appearance of the alien, which is credited as one of the first potential full appearances of Venom. But really, 1988, you're right, because he's first called Venom. But here's why I want the code. I got a Venom 26 this week, and I know that Isaac didn't. And I want to make him jump through some hoops. He stole your book. 
he's going to earn that code. And if not, I still got the screenshots of his address and uh, we will rally the troops and drive to, to Colorado to commit yeah. a felony because we would all be fighting a 16 year old, but it's in the yeah. name of a righteous cause. Yeah, that, that's, Amen, that's, that's, that's one way to get lots of comics, I guess, man. You know? <laughs> yeah. But, uh, Isaac, I, Isaac's in the chat right now saying, no, please don't. Please don't. <laughs> Yeah, Isaac's uh, mom's gonna wake him up one morning and be like, uh, there are a bunch of old dudes standing <laughs> on our front yard. What did you do? <laughs> oh man. Some, oh, yeah. There's some guys that just look like they're from Red Border. <laughs> <laughs> oh Christ. I I don't know how they're gonna wrap that book up in just one yeah. more issue. There's no way, man, unless it's like a a hundred page book or something like that, but yeah. Yeah. Or it turns into like the end of uh, Django Unchained, where it's yeah, like right. you're reading 700 pages of just a lot of people getting shot, which <laughs> very true. Too. But yeah, yeah I, I I enjoyed it. Uh, I was excited for you all to to snag Barnes, and I'm excited to see what the next big announcement, who next year you're going to put up in the in the Hall of Fame. Oh, uh, we, we got we got some yeah. yeah. Two weeks from today, but we'll we'll be announcing that real soon, man, and you're gonna like it. Well, good yeah. job, fellas. I'm gonna go make sure none of my children have ran off down <laughs> down the street. Yeah, but maybe yeah. next time you'll get to see me go down the slide again. Yeah, man, you gotta you gotta listen to Robbie, man. He talked about you know fatherhood and stuff like that, man. So go ahead, go go do what you gotta do. <laughs> we'll do. Have a good night, guys. All right, brother. All right. Later, man. Later, man. Oh, that's yeah. fun. Here, another uh, one. Of Huh? I said another one in the books, man. Another great show. Another one in the books. Um, <laughs> Hero and the Kid said we lucked out with a Venom 26 and not one of those purple covers. Very good. Very good. Uh, I have to admit, Will, uh, I don't uh, I don't get I don't get Venom, but I'm sorry. I, I know the art is fantastic. I, I just yeah. haven't been able to get into it, but I know you're a huge Venom fan. So uh, That's one of the few Donny Case books you don't get, which is very surprising, but I know. I'm, it is what yeah. it is, you know. Definitely. So, uh, Poser, I will fight you, Isaac says. <laughs> Todd says, good luck, Poser. And then Isaac says, I am still mad at Poser. <laughs> and I, I think we might need to take a road trip and make all this stuff happen, bro. I just want to see a, I see yeah, a fight with the community. Like a Lost in Comics fight club, man. You know, yeah. we don't talk about fight club, man. But uh, I got to say, man, that, that's pretty uh, that's pretty brave of uh, Poser, man, to win just so he can keep it from, from Pixar. <laughs> <Man>. <laughs> that's awesome, dude. Yeah. So, again, as you said, awesome show. T time to put a bow on this show today. If you are just joining us late, dude, go back, watch the replay, because we had an amazing interview with Rodney Barnes. Mind-blowing interview. Um, dude, if I was not a Rodney Barnes fan before, I will read every issue of Rodney Barnes. I will watch every television show, yeah. any movie that comes out that he is writing. Incredible interview. Incredible. Yeah. Um, just it's one of those ones that makes you look at he, he helps you get, gain perspective in life he talked yeah. about being a father uh, about the way he writes his the, writes his books with all these different threads of hope and humanity just incredible go back and watch the interview if you did not see it um and we had a great time with him one of my definitely one of my favorite shows that we've ever done for sure yeah so <laughs> we can't uh Unfortunately, we got to say goodbye. We love you guys, Lost in Comics family. Yeah. Thank you. Make sure you like this video. Subscribe to the channel if you haven't. And we will be on Hero and the Kid on Sunday at 5 p.m. Central Time, 6 p.m. Eastern Time. Make sure you go follow him, like their uh, video, subscribe to their channel so you can see us on Sunday. We are excited. We love you guys. We're full of energy. We will yeah. see you next time on Lost in Comics. Later, y'all. I just want to say, say bye. Later. Bye. Bye. Love you. bye. 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 No, bye. Go. Leave.